Welcome to the ministry of Barefoot Church. I'm Clay Neesmith, the pastor here at Barefoot Church. And man, we hope what you experience here today uh, will encourage you, motivate you, and inspire you in a great, great way. I want to talk to you today on the subject of getting in God's will. Getting in God's will. And again, it's important to get in God's will simply because God created you and God created me for greatness. The Bible says humanity has stepped away from God's glorious standard or God's greatness that he's created humanity for. Uh, we've stepped away from that, but, but God is in the business of getting us back on track, and so he wants us to be in his will. And in order to be in God's will, a lot of people think, uh, that the word in order to get in God's will is this word called obedience. And obedience is a byproduct of getting in God's will, but really what God is after in the human heart is this word called trust. Let's all say that word together, trust. Okay, let's say it again together, trust. God wants you and me to trust him. And, and when we do trust him and we believe that he has our best interest in mind, and he has created us for a significant purpose, then the obedience will, will begin to follow. But today, I want to talk to you about this idea of getting in God's will and this idea of trust. Even when Jesus was here on earth, and he was doing miraculous things, there was still a lot of people that didn't trust him. The Bible says that, that basically made Jesus have compassion in his heart. I mean, think about it for just a minute. He went to, to one wedding, and he, he turned, he turned uh, the water into wine. They had run out of joy at the wedding. They had run out of wine. And the Bible says that Jesus comes on the scene. He does this miraculous thing, and he turns, he turns the water into wine so that the, the party could have joy again, Okay. But what people were doing is they were focusing so much on the miracle that they were missing the message. And I want us to understand today that Jesus did a lot of physical miracles throughout the scriptures. They're recorded, and he still does physical miracles today. But the whole reason Jesus does miracles is, is simply to share a message about who God is in the human heart. And these people were missing the message, and they were focusing on the miracle. I wonder how many people are like that today. They're looking for God to do a miracle. They don't understand the message that God is trying to share through the miracle. The Bible says that Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. I'm talking about people who were physically blind. People saw it. Great crowds saw people do Jesus do this miracle. The Bible says that Jesus made the lame walk again. The Bible even goes on to say, as you continue on, that there was a miracle that Jesus did towards the end of his human life, and he raised a man from the dead named Lazarus. Lazarus was dead for a long, long time, and Jesus went to his grave, and Jesus told him to come out of the grave, and the Bible says he comes out. Jesus says, take his grave clothes off, and, and Jesus does this great miracle. But right after this, this miracle happens, the Bible says something that's pretty fascinating to me, and I want to share it with you today because I really believe it has a lot to do with this idea of seeing Jesus do miracles, but not trusting the message God has for your heart. And there's a big difference. Uh, the Bible says this in John 12, verse 37. Despite all the miraculous signs, turning water into wine, healing the lame, healing the blind, making a man come back from the dead, the Bible says despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. Now that's an interesting statement that John, the writer here, unveils to us. Because what that means is you can see Jesus do miracles, amazing things, and miss the message that God 
wants to send to your heart in the miracle. See, Jesus didn't come into this earth to just fix pandemics. He didn't come in this world just to fix relational things. He didn't come in this world just to fix, bring racial reconciliation. He didn't come in this world just to, to heal human bodies and, 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 and fix them. No, you need to understand every time we see Jesus physically doing a miracle when he was walking here on earth, it was simply to, to begin to get people to pay attention to a greater miracle. So the Bible says the people saw him do the miracles. In other words, they, they believed he could do a miracle but they didn't understand his message. And there's a big difference. And see, in order to understand his message, you have to understand why he was doing miracles. He was doing miracles to unveil, to reveal who God is to the human soul. And God has been about unveiling who he is to your heart and my heart ever since the human race stepped away from him in the garden. In other words, God desires relationship with us. And God has created you, you and me, and all other human beings for this relationship. But in order for the relationship to work, you have to trust God. And lots of people in Jesus' day were seeing great things, but they weren't trusting the message that Jesus you know, there's an old preacher story uh, about a man named Charles Blondin who was a tightrope walker and he tied a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And this story has some significance about getting in God's will and, and trusting God kind of where we're going today. And so John or, or Charles Blondin, uh, he went to Niagara Falls many, many years ago and he would walk across Niagara Falls with great crowds of people on both sides cheering for him. And the story is told where Charles Blondin was there one day, he walked across the, the, the tightrope and people cheered for him. And then he basically decided to go across Niagara Falls um, uh, blindfolded. And so he goes across Niagara Falls blindfolded and people are cheering for him. They see him do basically this miraculous feat, this, this feat that was very, very difficult and, and very, very risky. And they're cheering and they're screaming and they're hollering. And then Charles Blondin, he grabs a wheelbarrow, much like this one here. And he rolls it across Niagara Falls. gets to the other side and everybody is screaming and hollering, that is a miracle. That is amazing. That is incredible. But, but see, Charles Blondin wasn't looking for them to just cheer. He, he desired for them to trust that he could do the feats. And so Charles Blondin heard the people cheering and though they saw him do these things, he didn't really know if they trusted him to do the things again. So he asked this remarkable question. As they were cheering, we believe, we believe. He says, who believes that I can push this wheelbarrow back across Niagara Falls blindfolded? And all the people again are screaming, they're hollering, yes, we believe, we believe, we believe. We saw you do one thing, we believe you can do it again. And in order to make sure they believed, Charles, Charles Blondin asks this question. He says, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? In, in other words, everyone said, they believed based on what they saw. But in their heart, 
they, they really weren't trusting that Charles Blondin could get back to the other side with them in the wheelbarrow. And the reason I tell that story, which is probably fabricated a bit by preachers down through the century, is, is simply to get you and I to understand what it means to trust God, to get in God's will, so to say, to get in God's will bearer. In other words, what does it mean to trust Christ? What does it mean to, to basically trust, trust God in the midst of trouble? Because there's this notion that Jesus has come into the world to fix things. He's kind of like a, like a master builder where he comes in and, you know, he fixes things up just to make things better. And yes, he can make things better. But make no mistake about it, the message in all the miracles and the message that Jesus shared throughout his life and through his miracles was he came into the world to reconcile people back to their relationship with their creator and their great God. Come on, somebody. And so what he wants you and I to do is to trust him as a reconciler, whether he does a miracle or he doesn't do a miracle. And Jesus also made this remarkable statement. In this world, you will have trouble. In other words, trouble is coming. Trouble is here. So how do you get through life trusting God and not having your heart so uh, troubled? Well, I really do believe it has to do with what you trust about God. And in John chapter 14, after it says in John 12 that Jesus did all these miraculous things and people still didn't believe in his message, the Bible goes on to say that he begins to talk about dying and going to a cross. His followers didn't really understand it all. And he, he says this today about, about trusting God, and I want to share it with you because I really believe it's going to help a lot of us trust God in a real way in the midst of the trouble that is going on in our world today. Jesus says this in John chapter 14, verse 1. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. In other words, Jesus knew trouble was coming. He knew they were going to be troubled when they watched him get executed on a cross. They knew they were going to be troubled when, when he, their leader, was, was going to be pinned to a cross, nailed to a cross. He, he knew it. And he says, but hey, when, when you see all of that, that trouble, that thing that's going to trouble your heart, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. And here's why. He says, I got an antidote for it. He says, here it is. Trust in God and trust also in me. In other words, what you see is really happening. It really is real. But you can trust who I am and what my message is through all of this. He goes on to say this. There is more than enough room in my father's home. In other words, I'm getting ready to die on a cross. He says, but I want you to know that there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you. So that, that's key. So that you will always be with me where I am in the relationship. And you know the way to where I am going, he says to the disciples. But the disciples, one of them speaks up and says, no, we don't know, Lord, where you're going. We have no idea where you're going, Thomas says. So how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father. No one can be reconciled back to God. He says, except through me, except through the way that I am, am providing. And so why is this so important? Because this, in a nutshell, helps us trust God when our hearts are troubled. Helps us trust what God is doing. 
helps us trust God's amazing plan. And again, if you get this today, then whenever trouble comes, because it's coming, it's not going away. In other words, <clears throat> Jesus never promised it would go away. He never promised that he would fix all the trouble. He never promised that he would do a miracle every time, you know what, somebody got sick. He never promised that he would open every blind person's eyes. He never promised any of that stuff. But he did it in order to get a message across. And guess what? He may do it in your life today too. But the truth of the matter is, if he don't do it, or he does do it, his message to the human heart and to people globally is the same message that he delivers here in John chapter 14, is you can trust in me because I am a God with a vision, I'm a God with direction, and I'm a God with a relationship that I so desire with the human heart. And the question is, will you get in my will? Or will you continue to go your own way and do your own thing? And understand that if Jesus does a physical miracle in your life, amazing, but it's for the glory, the majesty of the creator and God. It's to share a message. We're, we're, we have, have been affected by this thing called sin, missing the mark of God's glorious standard. Every single one of us. And the interesting thing is, you know what? God loves us too much to leave us in that condition for eternity. So he comes to, to do something about the sin problem. This is the whole uh, story of the cross and the resurrection. Jesus comes to forgive humanity of their sin problems so they can be reconciled back to God. And when you're reconciled back to God, what God is doing is he's getting you to trust him through the whole process. I mean, it's a miracle that Jesus came back from the grave after cruelly punished on a cross. But the whole reason God displayed that was simply so you and I could trust him for eternity. He did it not so we could live in a world that has sin in it, trouble free for the rest of our life. No, he's going he's gonna to eventually do away with this world, the Bible says. In other words, he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to merge the two together is how I understand it from the scripture. And it's going to be amazing. And by the way, you know what? If he don't fix that limb on your body, if he don't make the cancer go away, he's still God. And he's still got the same message. He may do it, but if he does it, He's simply doing it. You know what? Not so you can live in that sinful body for the rest of your life. He's doing it to show his amazing power and grace to get through you to somebody else or to you how awesome and incredible he is. He's a God who reconciles. But you weren't made to live in the condition you're in forever. And the interesting thing is, God will bring you back to himself. The Bible says in this new heaven and this new earth, He's going to give you a new body. How amazing is that? I ain't going to have this fat roll no more. It's going to be incredible. When I walk on this stage, I'm not going to have to like, you know, try to get up the steps like an old man, you know, anymore. It's amazing. And, and see, but, but see, some of us don't have a vision for that. We don't have a vision for the new world. We, we want to cling to this. We want to cling to what's here, what's now. And again, at the end of the day, the world we live in now, we, we can improve it. And it's awesome because we can bring God values and things into it. But the Bible says that it's messed up. It's messed up. It's missed the mark of God's glorious standard. And if we can understand this message today and we can understand that, you know what, it ain't going to always be that way, then when trouble strikes, we understand why trouble is there. It's because humanity has stepped away from God's incredible, incredible plan. The Bible calls it sin, missing the mark of God's glorious standard. But the truth of the matter is God in his loving mercy, kindness, and grace comes into the world to do something about it, to reconnect the human heart back to him amazing and so how does Jesus do that trust in God trust also in me 
what he does is first and foremost, he shares the big picture, the, 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 the vision. He says, why would I tell you that I'm going to prepare a place for you if it wasn't true? I mean, he says, I'm telling you the big picture. I'm going away for a little while. Your heart may be troubled when you see me die, but, but I'm going to raise from the, be raised from the grave. And what I'm going to do, he, he doesn't unveil this to them all, but I'm going to go and sit at the Father's right hand, and I'm going to put every single enemy under my feet. And then I'm coming back. Man, I, I don't know about you, but I can begin to get through some trouble when I understand that Jesus is preparing a place for me. And not only has he prepared a place for me, he's set the direction for me to get there. He's such a good God. He doesn't leave any question about how to get there. You know, if I wanted to take you to an amazing part and I wanted you to hurry up and get there in a couple of hours and it was in Charleston and you were driving from North Myrtle Beach, I, I would say, now, Richard, here's how you get to the party. <laughs> I, I know the way and it's the truth and it's going to bring life to you when you get to the party. And so what I would say is, Richard, how you get to the party is let me give you some clear directions. You get on 17 and you go south until you hit Charleston. And then you're going to be at the party. And so I, I've said, here's the way. I'm being very inclusive, very direct, okay? You get to the party this way. However... You know, Richard decides that he knows a better way. And he says, no, no, no. I I'm going to get to the party, but I'm going to go get on 95, and I'm going north. And then I'll get wherever and eventually get to the party. I'm like, no, I want you to get to the party. So let me give you clear direction. Get on 17, you drive south, and in a couple of hours you're going to end up in Charleston and the traffic's not too bad. And he's like, no, 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 I, I, I want to get on, uh, on I-95 and take, you know, that route. And I'm like, dude, I want you there. See, the interesting thing is in this passage where Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, a lot of people think Jesus is being very exclusive because he's being so direct and saying, here's how you get back to the Father. People are like, well, what about all the other ways? Well, here's the deal. Jesus just wants to have such compassion on you, he don't want you to miss it. And so he's like, Richard, if you drive on I-95, you're going to keep going north and you're never going to get to the party. Let me be crystal clear. Let me come back to you with great compassion. And let me tell you, you're trying to get to the party the wrong way. You're never going to get to the party unless you get on I-17. Let me be direct uh, on Highway 17. It's right out here, and you got to go south. You can't go north. I, I know the way. I've been there. I know where the party is. It's incredible, and, and I'm trying to get you to understand. But what do we all argue? No, no, no. God, you quit being exclu uh, exclusive. There's a lot of ways. No, no, no. God has set the direction to the party. He has set the direction for humanity. It is through Christ Jesus, and all I'm inviting you to do is to Trust God's message. Come on, somebody. Like, well, you're telling me I'm going in the wrong direction. How cruel. No, I'm not. How compassionate. Because the truth of the matter is we've all been going in the wrong direction before. Why would I let you drive to New York? Why would Jesus let you drive to New York if the party was really in Charleston? And be wrecked. See, Jesus in his goodness is clear. He gives clear vision about what's going to happen. Gives clear direction. And then he reminds us that God is personal. I love what he says in, in John chapter 14, verse 3. He says, when everything is ready, 
He says, I will, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. See, I want us to understand how personal God is. See, no matter if you were the only person on the planet and you stepped away from his amazing plan, God would do whatever he had to do in order to get the relationship reconnected, reconciled. That's why God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son. Whoever believes, whoever trusts in him and his message and what he came to do, the Bible says, will not perish, will not waste away, but have everlasting life. And Jesus says, here's the deal. He says, man, let me give you the vision again. I'm going to prepare a place for you because you were created to be with God. You were created to be in a right relationship with God. Let me give you the directions how to get there. Let me be crystal clear. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Would you get in my will? Would you get in my will, Barah? And let me take you to the other side. And then he says, I so desire this because I want to spend, I want to spend eternity with you. I prepared this place for you and I want to be with you forever. That's an amazing, amazing truth. How could you not trust a God who so desires for you to be with him forever and ever and ever? that you can't see his goodness through all he did in Christ Jesus. I love how King David put this in a song he wrote. The song is Psalm 23, and I want to share it with you because God is so personal. He wants to touch each and every one of our hearts. And what God knows is there's things that are going to come in your life and my life that's going to trouble your heart. But he wants you to trust him amidst the trouble. And the only way to trust him is get the big picture, get the direction, and get how personal he really is. And so King David wrote this song. It's called Psalm 23, and this is, is basically what it says. It starts off with, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. In other words, I got, a, I got a shepherd that's leading me along the journey. I have all I need. Later on in the song, he says, even when I walk, through the darkest valley. When I'm in the most trouble, my heart is pounding out of my chest. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Remember, Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. David says, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they, they, uh, they teach and they comfort me. And he goes on to say, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies, in the presence of my enemies, in the midst of my trouble. He says, God, you are preparing a feast for me. He says, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and your unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. So see, maybe you're here today saying, man, you know what? I don't know if God cares enough about me personally to, to put me in his will. I need you to understand the Bible says that he foreknew you in before you were ever born. He, he knitted you together in your mother's womb. And he had a purpose and a plan for your life, but you were born into the same world I was born into. And because we've all missed the mark of God's glorious standard, God has done something incredible to reveal who he is and who his heart is, that he wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us through Christ Jesus, through the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. But I want you to get what David is saying here. He says, man, I know that there's going to be trouble in the world. I know there's going to be challenges in the world. But in the midst of the worst enemy I face, in the midst of the Worst trouble I face. God, you, you still have a vision. And that vision is to be in a personal relationship with me. 
Because what the Bible says is David pins, he says, in the presence of my enemies, God, you prepare a table for me. In other words, you know, with all the chaos going on in the world today, Vince, can you come help me out for just a second? Uh, God's inviting you to sit down at his table. Vince, do you mind sitting right here? Okay. And, and I want you to know it's, it's this person, and David understood it to be this person. God's saying, hey, would you take a seat at my table? There's a lot of craziness going on in the world today. Those, those things could distract you. Okay? Your phone could be going off if you were invited to the table, right? But God says, in the presence of all your enemies, all the distractions, I'm not distracted at all. I'm still setting the table. All the things that tend to worry us as human beings don't have God worried at all. And, and what God so desires is this personal relationship with you. He's inviting you to come sit down. He's preparing a place for you. He's preparing a table for you. And, and he so desires it to be intimate and personal. He's inviting you to the table. And he knows that things are gonna distract you, take your attention away. But the Bible says, he still says, hey, slide up your chair and we're going we're gonna to eat together. We're going to dine together. And I, I really believe this is a picture of where a lot of people are today. They're not taking their seat at God's table. They're not getting in the wheelbarrow because they're distracted by all the troubles that are going on in the world. And they're inviting God to come fix all the world problems. When God says, all the world problems are there, but I'm inviting you with all those distractions going on to come sit and dine with me at my table personally. My question is this, will you continue to move away from God or will you receive his invitation? Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. David Penn, God, I know that you set a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, my enemies don't distract you at all. You're still setting the table. And I need you to know in the midst of all that's going on in the world today, God is not distracted. He's still pursuing the human heart. Vince, thank you for sitting down with me. Okay, yeah. And he can take his seat. The reason I share that with you today is some of us are not trusting God and trusting also in Jesus. We're trusting just in a miracle that he might can do. Or we're hoping in a miracle he might can do. No, trust in his message came to reconcile you through Christ Jesus back to himself. God is so madly in love with you. He won't let anything distract him from setting that table. The invitation's open, but you have to come into the relationship by trust, by faith, and get in the wheelbarrow or sit down in the seat because God is in love with you. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for the great invitation. God, thank you so much for setting the table for each one of us. Thank you so much, God, for preparing a place for us and God, I pray for all of us who have a troubled heart right now by what we may see going on. That God, we would, we would trust in God and trust also in Jesus and trust his vision, his direction, and the person of who you are. God, you've created us for greatness. 
God, there's so many things that are trying to pull us away from that and distract us. But God, you are calling us back. And God, if there's one here today that hasn't put their faith in what you did by sending Jesus into this world, dying on the cross and resurrecting from a grave, God, I pray today that they would surrender. They would understand the message of the reason you did that is simply for reconciliation to reconcile them back to yourself. My friend, Jesus offers forgiveness for all your misses, all your sin. With his great love on a cross, every single one of us. The question is, is will you receive it? He, he rose from a grave and he displayed that to humanity. Will you believe in God's incredible power? And it's for you. It's to help you do life in a troubled world. It's to help you put your faith in him that, you know what, he's got a bigger vision for your life. And you say, God, today I surrender. I surrender to my will, my way, and I trust who you are. My friend, that's what it means to put your faith in Jesus, to trust Jesus. God, I trust you love me so much you came for me. You've reconnected me to you. And God, I want to follow you all the days of my life. I want to stay in the wheelbarrow. My friend, again, obedience follows, but it starts with trust. And the question is, do you have faith in God's good gift of Jesus to humanity? Just say, God, today I surrender and I receive the gift. If you mean that with your heart, I believe God says, welcome home. Welcome home because you know what? You are part of his family because you believed and trusted and you got in his will. In Jesus' name, we pray this prayer. Amen. We hope you were encouraged, motivated, and inspired today by the message. And again, man, we believe in you. We believe great things for you. It's because of many people's faithful giving that we're able to go out around the world. If you choose to invest in Barefoot Church, just go on over to barefootchurch.com. You can give there. But go out, live your purpose, and be inspired in a great, great way.